Hello and welcome to Null's Retro Lab. Today we're going to go back to the Spectra Video 328 that was giving us so much trouble. I just got some of the parts that we needed, so let's see if we can get it working again. So here's the SVI 328, the way we left it last time, still not working. I just checked it just in case it suddenly started working, but no, uh, we're getting no kind of clock oscillation right there. And I just got a new VTP, a new video chip. So we're going to pull this one out and replace it with this one and see what happens. So there's one thing that I'm usually not very good at, and that is taking care of making sure that I don't have any static charge in me and potentially damage some electronic circuit. So I've been told that the VTP is particularly um, fragile and particularly susceptible to um, static discharges. So I'm going to be wearing my wrist discharger for the rest of the repair. Hopefully that will help. So this one right here has a heat sink and it's glued on. So I'm going to have to remove this by hand. There we go. And now let's carefully put in the new VDP. It doesn't have a heat sink, so I won't worry for it for now, but maybe later I should consider transferring it or putting something else. Okay, that went in pretty easy. Let's give it a test. Okay, before anything else, let's see if we have the clock signal back that we were expecting. And that was pin 39 and 38. There we go. That's that's the way it's supposed to look like. And pin 40, which is the other part of that oscillation. Perfect. So, okay, that makes me feel better. The VDP was definitely faulty and this one seems to be working. So let's see if we get a video signal. So I don't know what happened, but I went to test again the clock and it was gone. And then I'm looking around and like nothing seems to be working. So. I don't know what's going on. So we need to remeasure voltages actually before we even do voltages. I'm going to check that the fuse hasn't blown while I wasn't looking. No, the fuse is still there. Let's turn it on. Let's start. Let's see. Ground over here. And input. Yeah. And grant. Okay, so our five volt regulator seems to be blown. What about the 12 volt one? Input is fine. No, nope, but it's fine. So it looks like that one. It's bad. I don't know why that happened just now. I mean, I know it's not heated up to the heat sink, but I'm only turning it on for 30 seconds at a time at most. So it shouldn't be heated up enough to cause that. So maybe this is the time to finally get rid of this whole uh, regulator, which was very suspect from the beginning anyway, and try to fit a 7805 in the board the way it was supposed to be. I was just thinking about this and I wonder if the voltage regulator wasn't a fritz and maybe it was given voltage spikes and that's what blew up the VDP. And now finally it just completely blew up. So it's probably a good thing to replace it completely. So just give this a good cleaning after desoldering it. And you can see that the heads of the tracks have been stripped from some other time. So whoever installed these cables did a rather poor job and um, destroyed those tracks. Now that's probably not a big deal. I suspect they were making connection just fine. It certainly wouldn't account for the voltage regulator not giving out five volts in the output pin but it's something to watch out for when I solder the new one. 
So after desoldering the cable and cleaning it, the holes are still not very big. And last time I had trouble fitting the voltage regulator. So I'm going to try to use these tools. They're just um, metal, tiny metal rods that don't tend to stick. I don't know what metal they are. They don't stick to solder. And so I can heat up the pad and push it through. Like that. There you go. There you go. Perfect. And that went in great. So uh, I just needed to clean those holes really well. And this is the 7812. Yeah, that one goes right in. Perfect. Okay, and now for the cable that was missing there. I think that's ground. All right, let's test the voltages. We get five volt output, perfect. 11, 12 input, and here 24 input and 12 output. Great. Okay, maybe we're back to where we were at the beginning. <laughs> Let's test the video out. So there's still something weird going on because I went to test things and I saw that I had no voltage again. So let's do some measurements. I'm gonna put ground right in the plane. And yeah, it's a little low, but it's, uh, it's okay. Although it's dropping. Why is it dropping? It should be five volts as well right here. And it keeps dropping in. Oh. Oh, wow. It just drops right in front of our eyes to almost nothing. Uh, that's not good. Could it be that? Yeah, this is really hot. I wonder, I mean, normally I'm used to be able to run in the 7805s without a heat sink for a few minutes and yeah, they get hot, but that's fine. Maybe there's a lot of current draw, especially now that we've hooked up the video RAM to also use the five volt rail instead of the 12 volt. So maybe there's extra demand on the, um, the current being drawn from this voltage uh, regulator and it just heats up really quickly. And as it crosses certain temperature threshold, the, then it just can't function and it drops the voltage. <laughs> At least it dropped the voltage as opposed to going up and blowing up the whole board. That's easy to test though. I can just hook up a heat sink uh, that I have leftovers from the ZX Spectrum and uh, see if the voltage stays stable for, for a minute. <laughs> so this is a heat sink that, um, from a ZX Spectrum that attaches to a 7805. And I have spare ones because I often change the voltage regulator with more modern ones that don't require any kind of um, heat sinks. So I just have spares of these. Normally you would put some thermal paste to make sure that there's good contact. I'm not gonna worry about it for now. This is just temporary. We'll definitely put thermal paste once it goes back against the um, heat sink that came in the case. All right, let's give this a try now. So far so good. Oh, it's dropping a little bit. No, but it's holding stable now. Well, dropping very slowly. So this has been sitting here for a couple of minutes and yeah, 4.9, perfect. Should get it everywhere. Yeah, a little voltage drop, that's normal. All the way down here, yeah. Okay, so that was definitely our problem. Okay, finally time for the real test. Let's see what we get. Oh, we got something. Oh, 
Okay, there are multiple things going on in here. One of them that I key is pretty impressed. If I don't do that, okay, stop. And then the image keeps cutting in and out and it's greenish. There's no color to it and it has a weird pattern. Hmm. That's not good. I mean, we're making progress, but that's not very good. All right. I was about to start diagnosing the video out signal, kind of like what we did with the Apple II that was getting a, um, a monochrome image. And then I looked more closely at the VDP that I ordered to replace the other one. And I'm like, yeah, okay, it's TMS9918. And I looked at the data sheet again, and it seems fine. And then I finally realized, I'm sure a lot of you experts on MSX video chips looked at it from the beginning and were already yelling at the video. 9918 is an NTSC chip. So it outputs video at 60 hertz and with a different color information than we expect in PAL. That's why we were still seeing some image and it didn't have any color information. And then it kept cutting in and out probably because the TV is not expecting an NTSC signal. So I'm afraid what we need to do is wait to get a 99 28A VDP. And hopefully if everything else is working at the moment, it will be a matter of putting it in and everything will just work. So let's see if that fixes it. And with the magic of video, I can snap my fingers and the new VDP appears. I wish it were like that in real life. So anyway, here we have our TMS 9929A and this should output PAL signal. So let's try it out. Okay, everything is plugged in and I even have the um, heat sink on the voltage regulator. And let's turn it on and just see if we get some video. Wow, we get nothing. Nothing like we don't even have the, we don't even have a signal given the message still on the TV. Okay, so let's start checking that we are getting a solid five volts in the VTP and yeah, that's perfect. So it is powered. And now let's check the clock signal around the oscillator, the one that was not working before. And wow, yeah, that's, this is supposed to be oscillating between zero and probably that voltage and the other pin. Yeah, but they're both getting steady for, so clearly this can work. Yet we know the oscillator is working because when I put in the NTSC VDP, it was working fine. And it was even not putting composite videos, just NTSC versions. So maybe they sent me a faulty TMS 9929A. That would just be my luck. I'm waiting four weeks and then I get a faulty one. So as I'm working on the board, the 7805 voltage regulator keeps being knocked around because it had the huge heat dissipator in it and eventually it just cracked. So I got sick of this whole thing because it's really uncomfortable to work with this board here and, and the keyboard still attached and then this with the heat dissipator. So I ended up just removing this and replacing it with a Traco power modern voltage regulator. So it doesn't generate any heat, it doesn't need any heat sink so this should be much better okay and now uh wait what is the ti 994a doing here isn't this a video about the svi 328 yes but they actually have one thing in common well they may have multiple things but they at least have one thing in common between this computer and the svi one which is they both use the same video chip so the one that is giving us so much trouble is the same video chip as the TI-994A. So instead of returning the other one to eBay and getting another one and waiting three weeks and then finding out that it's still not working, I'm going to open it up and temporarily borrow the VTP and try it out on the SVI-328. And then if it works, then we'll deal with returning the other faulty chip. But in the meanwhile, let's give this one a try. And there's the TMS with the heat sink and everything. So that seems to be a common way of using it. They all seem to need a heat sink. So fortunately it's socketed, so let's carefully remove it. I'd also be tempted to remove the 
heat setting to actually read what the exact model is. And that way we can put a new set of fresh conductive um, paste. And let's make sure we get the top, the, the direction right. So this is not marked in the socket, but everything is pointing this way. So that should be the zero or the pin one. So I'm going to do this to remember. Okay, here we go with the right, in the right direction. Let's give it a try and see if we get the clock signal with the new VTP. Wow, there you go. There you go, 10 point something megahertz. So now if we hook it up to video out, I'm sure we'll see an image on the screen. I've plugged in the video cable and let's see what we get. Okay. All right. Well, we're clearly getting something. <laughs> so this is this is the best we've seen in a long time. And this I'm not too concerned about. It's probably we're just pressing the keyboard. Yeah. Okay. But we're hmm, it's almost like we're missing one bit. So it sounds like one of the memory chips is not working correctly. Okay, since they are socketed and the missing bit that I was seeing was on the left, I figured the easiest way instead of starting to look at it with the oscilloscope or anything is just to pull it out and put in one that I know works. So we'll start with that one and turn it on. And, and that looks okay. The colors are pretty bad, but I think that's just the LCD. Uh, the, the, the little glitch that we had before is definitely gone. So that looks good. We finally have a reasonable video out for the SVI 328. Yay. Wow. I almost can't believe that we got it working. It's been such a long time since we made any forward progress in this project. And it turns out that it first ordered the wrong chip, then they sent me a faulty chip. So now it seems it's working again. So I'm definitely going to have to buy another one of those chips, but for now we'll continue borrowing it from the TI-99 4A. If I've learned anything working with the SVI-328 is that once something is working, don't touch it. So clearly I haven't learned that because I'm actually going to remove the um, heat sink and I want to see exactly what kind of chip this is. Maybe it's a different one than the one I bought. And then we can use that opportunity to put new fresh uh, thermal paste, although this looks pretty fresh. Hopefully that makes it easy to remove. And yes, I have my wrist grounding protection. Yeah. Yeah, okay, it wasn't as it wasn't as fresh as I thought. TMS 9929A NL. The NL is separate. The other one that we have is all together, but that's clearly not good. I mean, they're very, very different, but I suspect this is a recent manufacturer, assuming it's even a real chip. I suppose it could be a fake one. Anyway, I've already started the process on eBay to try to get either a replacement or my money back. Somebody went a little overboard with a thermal paste here. I'm also going to mark it again where the zero spot is. And now let's make sure that everything is still working. And this time we'll try it on the CRT TV. And yeah, that looks great. And the color looks fantastic. Throughout this repair, there's been one thing that has been a constant thorn at my side, and that's those connectors. Watching this video, you probably don't get a good idea of how much I hate having to work with those ribbons. It's so uncomfortable. Every time you flip the board over, you need to move the keyboard and hold everything together. And 
not only that, but this is actually coming apart. It's the, the protection, it's pretty much done. And if you noticed, someone patched this up because this is coming undone in here. Someone patched this up and I patched that up a while ago thinking that maybe this was related to some of the problems we were having, which it really wasn't. Uh, because this little board takes care of the conversion into a composite video signal and the RF modulation, as well uh, as the um, cassette ports. And I don't know if there's some amplification there or something that I suspect it probably does. So it's kind of an auxiliary board, but it's a pain. Now, there's nothing much I can do about this one because I think these ribbons are part of the keyboard membrane, so that's what it is. But this, this is just a connector. And this is 13 cables going from one to the other. So I'm going to try to replace this with something else that I can just unplug anytime I want to work on this computer. I kind of wish I had done it when I started, but the first order of business was to get things working. So this is what I came up with, which I don't know if it will work or not. These are called JST cables or JST connectors, specifically JST XH 2.54. I think 2.54 is the spacing in millimeters between the cables, which is kind of like the standard um, spacing in, in this kind of um, through hole components or breadboard pins, that kind of thing. Now, this is 14, this is 13 of them, which is a really odd number and large number. So I didn't see any that were that large. So I got, what are these? These are, I think, seven. So maybe I'll have two of them. And I was initially thinking of just cutting one end, but then I realized, hey, look, the board actually has 14 holes. So that should be exactly two of those and then um, solder them there. So let's try doing that. So this is not perfect, but I cut up some of the plastic in between the two connectors and I just fit it in the holes that we had and actually really tight already. Those were tiny, tiny little holes. So I'm gonna solder the back now and then I will solder the cables on the other board. Okay, and this last cable, we don't need it, so I can just take it out. There we go. And then we still need to deal with this ground cable over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this one instead. I'm gonna solder it in the same place, but then it will go screwed onto here, and this is the ground plane as well. So that should be fine. Okay, let's put everything back together in the case and see how it works. So here we use our grounding cable. And now we connect these cables. There we go, perfect. And let's not forget to screw on the voltage regulator. It's probably not as crucial with a 12 volt one, but still. Before I screw the case back on, there's one last detail that I want to fix, which is 
this key. I got the key and the plunger, so I believe we need to remove the keyboard from the other side to put everything back together. That's the key we're missing. And since I have the case apart, might as well give it a good cleaning. It wasn't very dirty to start with. So a light scrubbing with some generic window surface cleaner should do. It came out pretty good, but there's still some dirt stuck in there in the texture. So I'm going to use some baking soda and some water and scrub it all. And give it a quick rinse. Okay, this is looking good now. And the final touch. There you go. Perfect. Let's give it a final test so we can make sure that everything is working, including the keyboard, which we actually haven't even tested so far. Okay, it starts up just fine. And yeah, the keys seem to be working perfectly fine. It's a nice keyboard too, so yay, this works. And there you have it. We have a working SVI 328. How long did that take us? That was three videos and many, many weeks. So I'm excited to be at this point. One thing I didn't get a chance to do was to actually test the computer beyond just typing a few keys on the keyboard. So we're going to have a part four of this series in which I'm gonna try loading some games, see what it's capable of doing, as well as learning about the history of the SVI-328 and how it relates to the later MSX standard computers. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Until next video, See you then.